We are amazed when we think about the concept of forgiving and to be able to forgive people. We're amazed at that when we think about what Jesus has done for us, has done for a world, a world that uh, in, in all rights was uh, at odds with God because he's a holy God, he's a pure God. And the Bible says that we all have the same disease that the Bible describes as sin. Every human has that disease. There's, there's no person that's exempt from that. And the fact that Christ came and died and offered forgiveness uh, to that kind of world, as the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I, I think about that. It's not because we're valuable. Remember, we said it last week. I, I'm not that good. Say it with me. I'm not that good. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're not that good. <laughs> you enjoyed doing that, didn't you? Yeah, you enjoyed that. But it's the truth. We're really not. But, but Jesus came and died for us knowing that we were separated from God. Now, we have this big ego that we're battling with in our world today. And it's not new, but I think it's something that's growing and growing and growing. And somehow we think that we have better answers than the God who created and sustains all that you and I see and know of today. And so we find it very difficult to trust and to believe him. And even more so when it comes to this concept when we think of forgive. So this is really part two. If you were not here last week, I want to strongly urge you to go to our website. You can watch this message last week, part one. We're going to continue in part two. And I just, I just got to be honest with you, it may not be the last part. Um, when Sherry and I get back from our little mini sabbatical, we may just come back to this one more time because God will not release me from this. And I can say honestly, I don't think that I've had any more response from a congregation, from a people, than I have this week over this message. I, I think we're on to something. Let me rephrase that. I think God is on to something. I think God is speaking to our hearts. And, and boy, just the things that I heard this week, I thought, wow, God, that may explain a lot of the questions that I've had leading up to this. That, that this whole concept of being willing to forgive is something that we push back on, obviously, quite passionately. So we want to return to the same scriptures last week. We're going to go to chapter 4 of the book of Ephesians. Let me encourage you to get a copy of God's Word. There should be a, a, a Bible there in the seats in front of you somewhere if you don't have one, if you don't have an electronic copy like I do. Ephesians chapter 4. If you were here last week, you remember, we walked through the book of Ephesians, selected passages, put everything in context, walked through several different verses, and we, we actually established a, a foundation for forgiveness, if you will. What does the Bible say? I really think that Ephesians addresses that really comprehensively. In fact, those of you that are familiar with the book of Ephesians, while you're turning there, fourth chapter, we're going down to that last verse, verse 32. But as you're turning there, remember Ephesians was written, really it's about 50% doctrine, and then it's about, well, I'd say 50%, it's, it's about our standing in Christ, 50% about our walk with Christ or our condition in Christ. And it's about half doctrine and half application of doctrine. So it's really well, a really well-balanced book. It was written about 60 to 62 AD by none other than the Apostle Paul, one of the 13 letters in the New Testament that's attributed to him depending on where you put Hebrews in uh, whether or not that Hebrews is on that list in your mind and Paul's writing simply for the fact to take believers in Christ and to lead them forward to a point of maturity and it's interesting to me that it seems like the more I study the book of Ephesians this concept of forgiving is really in the center of that maturation process and and understandably so the more we unpack it the more we look at it and, and see what God has for us when it comes to this whole concept of, of forgiving. Let me just take a little unofficial survey. I guess we could have done a text survey this morning, but I didn't think about it. Let me just ask you, how many of you would rank forgiving others as one of the most difficult things you do? If that would be you, would you raise your hand? That's the majority of the room, yeah. It is an unbelievable battle, is it not? I mean, it's tough. And you would think that you'd get to a place in your life spiritually where that would become easier, where it would become something that you would 
do more frequently and, and you would just, it would become natural, but it's not. It's like every time we're offended, you know, I've told you this before, I'm going to have lunch hopefully next Friday with a, one of my mentors, a man named Fred Wolf, and Fred and Sherry and I are supposed to get together and uh, hopefully Ann, his wife as well, and Fred told me this a long time ago. He said, Tony, the problem with, with believers is they don't realize that every believer has had a supernatural offendectomy when they come to Christ. And I didn't know what that meant, just like some of you still don't know what that means. It means that your offender was removed. When you come to Christ, you, you literally are, if you surrender to the Holy Spirit, you really ought to have that offendectomy. That offender ought to be taken out of you. I mean, when you think about what Christ went through, what Christ has done for you, how can you be offended at people? And, and yet, we are. In fact, we live in the country that it's probably easier to get offended than any other place in the world because we're so entitled and we think so highly not soberly but we think highly of ourselves we think that everybody ought to bow the way we think the way we believe the way we think it ought to be and when someone cuts across the grain of that we so easily become offended I'm not even going to talk about driving in Denver right now okay (laughs) I have big issues there. I'm just telling you, that's probably my biggest sin battle right there, just my driving practices in Denver. The bad thing is, is when I get mad at someone who's done something to me and I whip around them and cut them off, most generally it's a church member when I get beside them. (laughs) And then I go, oh, well, that's another one you lost. See ya. You, You think I'm joking, don't you? There's a reason my pickup has all those scratches on it bumps and dings and and whatnot. Ephesians 4 32, be kind to one another tender hearted, forgiving each other just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. Just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. Last week we reiterated the point that forgiveness I believe is the key to all communication it's the key to all relationships and and our maturity and when we're not willing to forgive it limits our communication both vertically with God and it certainly limits our communication with our fellow man when there is anything left in us a spirit of unforgiveness when we're not willing to forgive it hinders that communication now God busted me in the nose with a passage of scripture that I know very well may I just read it to you I mean if you just one of those people that you don't trust me and you got to turn there go ahead and do that but it's out of Mark chapter 11 remember three weeks ago we were in Mark chapter 10 this is Mark chapter 11 beginning with verse 20 let me read as they were passing by in the morning they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up Being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered, saying to them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that he, what he is going to hap- what he is, says is going to happen, it will be granted to him. Now remember, he's speaking in the context of faith, and crying out, and speaking with faith, and seeing a mighty move of God. But he begins to deal with an issue, I believe, that hinders us seeing those kinds of things in our lives. He says in verse 24, Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, and they will be granted to you. Verse 25, whenever you stand praying, same context, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, listen to those words, anything against anyone anyone forgive when you stand praying if you have anything against anyone what was the word forgive listen if you have anything against anyone so that your father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions but if you do not forgive neither will your father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions I mean, does anybody else feel like they just need to kind of get down like this and say, God, when the lightning flies, I mean, do you feel that way at all? Do you feel that way? 
I mean, listen to what he says. So I got to thinking about that. That that sounds real spiritual and sort of grandiose in a way. But here's what God's saying to me. Tony, look, when you're trying to talk to me and you've got unforgiveness in your heart toward anybody about anything, you might as well shut it down, big boy. You need to make that right. You need to forgive just as I've forgiven you. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking like Peter. How long is it before I can ball up my fist and punch him in the nose? How many times do I forget? We're going to get to that passage in just a moment. But think about the context of what we just read now in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. So again, prayer without forgiveness, as I shared last week, is like an automobile without an engine. I mean, we're just, we're just not getting anywhere. We're not moving forward. And yet all of us have been duped to the point we have people in our lives that we're just not willing to forgive. Again, how absurd is that? Because the people that we're not willing to forgive, can I tell you, they slept like a baby last night while you were tossing and turning and agonizing and I can't believe what they did to me. Can you, this, my life is like it is today because they did this to me. And you know they promised me all this and they were going to be there and, I, and they're not forgiven. And, and I'm telling you, those people, they're... <laughs> Do you understand how Satan has so flipped this thing on us? And our lives are being destroyed while those that we're angry at most likely are are flourishing. So again, last week we established that biblical foundation through Ephesians. We went through many, many passages there. We, We explored what Thomas Watson said back of 300 plus years ago, that Puritan preacher who gave us those seven indicators that we might be forgiving. We looked at that. And again, three weeks ago, we looked at do you really want to see? Because folks, in order to be able to see spiritually, one of the things that we've got to do is to, what's the word? Forgive. Do we really want to move forward to God? Back in Ephesians chapter 4, let's back up to verse 17. And let's read into the context and maybe get a little deeper understanding, a little deeper grasp of what we're wrestling with here. Back at verse 17, Ephesians chapter 4. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind. In other words, there's to be a difference in you in Christ. Being darkened in their understanding excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. Exactly what Lang was was walking us through in scriptures earlier when he added that verse to the song. Verse 19, And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you... Did not learn Christ in this way. Verse 21. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self. Now underline those words. Now some of you scared to underline your Bible. I promise you it's okay. Underline if you have something. Underline electronically. Whatever you do. You lay aside the old self. In other words, there is an old man. There's an old person prior to Christ. That's done. You need to lay that aside. You cannot hang on to that any longer in Christ Jesus and not if you really want to see spiritually lay aside the old self which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit verse 23 and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind so this is a a transformation of our mind Romans speaks to that Paul writes about that there as well we're we're having a, a the battle is the mind and so there is a transforming of the mind a renewing of the mind we can't think like we used to think We can't respond like we used to respond. We can't live like we used to respond in Christ Jesus. It's new. Verse 24, not only do you take off something, but look at this, and you put on the new self in Christ. There's a new man. There's a new woman if you've yielded your heart and your life to Christ. There's a new way which we're to live which is in the likeness of God and has been created in righteousness and holiness to the, of the true. Now we're down in verse 25. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. And now it gets really serious. Are you still there? What verse are we in? We're going to 26 now. All right, now 26. So be angry. And yet do not sin. There is a righteous indignation. 
There is justification for being angry over sin. The, the, the Bible does not take that away. But listen. But don't let the sun go down on your anger. Verse 27, and do not give the devil an opportunity. Now listen, because he's going to tell you how you give the devil an opportunity. Are you listening? You want to know what that means? Or he's going to tell you. He says, he who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has, in need, who has need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. We're talking in context of, what was it? Don't give the devil an opportunity. And now we add to that, verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. You can grieve the Holy Spirit. Do you know how you do that? Do you know how you do that? Do you want to know how you do that? Well, then let's read the next part. By whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Here it is. Let all, look at this, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor and slander be put away with you along with all malice and then we're back to verse 32 be kind to one another tender hearted forgiving each other just as God in Christ also has so we give the devil an opportunity when we don't forgive when there's bitterness in us when there's wrath coming from us when there's clamoring, by the way, that word means we're noisy about it. That means our big yap is going, nyam, 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 about stuff all the time. That's clamoring. We're noisy about what's going on in our heart. In fact, what Paul is doing is he's laying out multiple manifestations here in verse 31. Multiple manifestations of a person who has unforgiveness in their heart. And he's saying, this is what you'll see in your life. Now, immediately, we all probably think of someone and we go, that's what's wrong with them. <laughs> the problem is, is somebody else just thought of you. <laughs> that, that's how that works. So again, we're grieving the Holy Spirit. We're giving the devil an opportunity to work in our lives when we don't let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away along with all malice. Again, that verse 31 is simply what I believe are manifestations or emotions that manifest themselves when there is unforgiveness in your heart. Look, I know how it works in my life. Can I tell you, listen to me, I, I don't know if you think, I, I joke with people all the time. I say, you know, Saturday night I go, I pull up a sermon online, I read it. And I stand up and I just read it to the people on Sunday morning. That's really not the way it works, in case you wondered. And can I tell you, God just, I don't know why, I'd love to just preach one time without God wearing me out about what I'm teaching. You know, it's like, God, really, can you get off me one week? You know, let, let, me, let me talk to somebody. But God, even this week, God dealt with me. That part about being kind to one another. Man, oh man, do you know how hard it is to be kind to those people that you know hate you? Hello? <laughs> but I got to tell you, there is a little joy in the fact that you know that kindness just sort of burns them up. Because <laughs> see, they know they hate you. They know they've been talking about you. They know they're looking for just any opportunity to find fault in you. And then you, you're nice to them. Oh, it just kind of tortures them. I kind of think that's part of God's plan, to be honest with you. I just really do. Or don't look at me like that. Now, some of those people don't know that I know that they hate me. But can I tell you, your best friend with a big mouth has a best friend with a big mouth. And that big mouth passes it on to that big mouth. All right, let's get off me for a minute. Can I tell you? How about the workplace? How about the real world where all of you people live in? I live in the bubble, right? What about the real world? Is that not how it works? And, and when you're kind to them, they're looking at you like, well, well what's going on here? Am I being punked? What, what's happening here, you know? For you older folks, candid camera kind of, yeah. <laughs> right? 
Landis, you're laughing over there. Was that, who was that? Oh, that was her. Okay, somebody else. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. Listen, verse 31, let me tell you what that is. That is the product of drinking that poison of unforgiveness in attempt to hurt others. We said it this week. You've heard it before. It's drinking the poison and thinking it's going to somehow harm someone else. But the truth is, if you're unwilling to forgive anyone, everyone of everything, then you're drinking the poison and, and it's, it's destroying you. And the manifestation of that is anger, clamor, bitterness, wrath, high blood pressure, and just go down the list of how that works. So let, let's get really practical. Again, we walk through Ephesians. So you, you look at that message, you'll, you'll pull up that theological foundation for that. I don't want you to think that I don't do that. But what, what is forgiveness not? That's the one thing we haven't yet explored in the last two weeks. What is forgiveness not? I mean, because I think we have some real misconception about this. So let me, let me eliminate some things off of the plate. First of all, I would say, and there's a lot of debate about this, I want to tell you. And, and look, it, other people have their right to be wrong. They disagree with me, they have their right to be wrong. That's okay if they want to be wrong. There are people who disagree, with it, but forgiveness is not forgetting. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Now listen, I know what God does. I know that he takes our sin and he throws it as far as the east is from the west. I know that he remembers it no more. I, I, I get that. I get that. But let me just tell you, there, there are some scars that you have that you cannot forget. I literally thought about having someone on a prompt walk in with a couple of chainsaws fired up right now. And I was going to say, if they attack some of you, now with our security force, they wouldn't get very far. So you're safe, okay? But if they were to attack someone, can I tell you, there's no way they would ever forget that assault, right? There's, there's no way. Probably would have some visible uh, manifestations of that that they would have to deal with forever. This is not about Forgetting. I want you to understand, I believe there is a difference in forgetting. It's not amnesia. It, it's, it, people claim, you know, I, I, I'll forgive, but I'll never forget. And my answer to that would simply be this. Don't forget, but here's what you need to remember. What you need to do is every time you think of that, you need to think about the fact that you forgave them for that. I have a scar. I think I've told you this story before. I know I was talking with Robert this week. I have a scar right here in my arm. Football, motorcycle racing, uh, motocross racing, all that, all my life. It's the only scar on my body. And you know how it happened? I had an uncle got mad at me and pushed me down. And I fell on a piece of glass, literally, and ripped my, my arm right here open. Now, can I tell you, I've forgiven my uncle for that. But there's no way I can, I can forget that. I don't, I don't remember it as in every time I look at it, I don't, oh, that, that bum pushed me. That's not how it is. So there's some things there that I, I want to let you off the hook. Now listen, but there is a difference in having amnesia about it, so to speak, and, and what 1 Corinthians 13 says. Because love, the Bible says, keeps no record of wrong. And, and the implication there is not that you don't remember it, but it's that you would use it against that individual. How many of you are married? How many of you are not sure? <laughs> we do this in marriage. We, it's horrible the way we do this. Do you ever get into a discussion with your spouse? Shane, and I do this. And we're, and we're getting better about it. She's getting better about it. Isn't she? I've had to work with her on this quite a bit, but she's getting there. We'll, we'll, get to, we'll get to something. Now you know why we're taking that sabbatical, right? Because my big man. But we'll, we'll get into a discussion about something, and she'll go back 20 years. Well, you say this, and you tell me this. And I, Sherry, I hadn't said that since I was in my teenage years. What are you talking about? I don't remember that. And I do the same thing to her, quite honestly. 
I bring up stuff. But, but we're, we're going to forgive. We're going to let that go. So, so again, Claire Barton, uh, which is the founder of the Red Cross, her statement was when they asked on time, don't you remember how you were hurt? And she said, no, but what I remember is that I chose to forgive it. That's a great way to look at it. So it's, it's not forgetting. Again, we can, you know, that one's kind of a fine line. I want to get that one out of the way before I go to the next one. Number, and number two, it's not fake. It's not fake. It's not pretending that I'm forgiving. We, we don't act like the past doesn't exist or that a hurt didn't occur. We no longer use the past hurts as a weapon. The past is a dead issue. We can't ignore that a hurt occurred, but we, we can't change the past either. And and wishing it never happened won't make it a go-, go away. So it's not faking it. You know, we believers in Christ Jesus, especially those of us who have been around church a long time, we like got PhDs in faking it, right? I mean, it's almost a cliche. We've, we've, we've talked about it ad nauseum. It's the corniest joke in the world. But, you know, you, you're driving to worship whenever it is, Wednesday or Sunday or Saturday, whenever it is that you go to worship. And, you know, you're in that automobile and you're ready to kill somebody. And you step out of that vehicle and you walk up to our greeters and they say, how are you doing today? Great. Great. In the South, it's hallelujah, I'm blessed. Praise God, brother. You know, that's how they do it there. And that's, we're good at faking it, aren't we? And the truth is, most people don't want you to be honest. I mean, they don't want you to lose your cookies emotionally right in front of them. Now, listen, I don't care what people tell you. They really don't want to know the truth. They just want to smile and fake with you and move on. There are few people that really desire to get deep enough to allow the Holy Spirit to move in that moment that we might actually care for one another and minister to one another. But so many of us are just, you know, it's just fake. So you can't fake forgiveness. Where's my Bible? Did I lose it? It's over there. Thank you very much. It's not a feeling. That's number three. It's a feeling. By the way, you go back to what we just read in 31. These come right out of it. It's an intentional action. It it has nothing to do with, with how we feel. When people say, I can't forgive, listen, this is what you're saying. You're really saying, I won't forgive. You can. Through the Holy Spirit, the power of God that lives in you, yes, you can. God never asks you or commands you to do anything that you cannot do. So when people say, I can't forgive him of that or her of that or them of that, what they're saying is, I refuse to allow Christ to be my Lord. I will not forgive. And you've just pushed back God. Forgiveness is an absolute clear choice of your will. It is a conscious decision. And we can feel hurt, betrayed, and angry and still forgive. You can do that because God has equipped you to do that with the Holy Spirit. Forgiveness is not weakness. It's not weakness. It's not giving in. The easy, most cowardly thing in the world to do is be unforgiving, to be bitter. The hard thing, the strong thing, is to forgive even when you've been hurt. Again, I, this week as I, I was preparing and, and thinking about this, my mind went back to a church. And I, well, let me tell you the whole story. I was down, I have a study down in the basement of our church, and that's where most of my books are. And, and even though I do everything electronically almost now, every once in a while I like to go down there and look through stuff. And I found one of my old journals from a ministry. I won't tell you where and when. But it was... Without a doubt, the most difficult season of my life. Now, by God's grace, I didn't realize how difficult it was until we were in transition into another church. And, and uh, Sherry and I were taking a little time off in between, a week off. And we were actually down in, the, in Florida at, at the beach at that time. And I was writing in this journal. And I was just being honest with God. God, I had no idea how hurt I was. And this was my prayer in the journal. I haven't seen this in a lot of years. And as I was writing in that journal, I also wrote, I said, God, please 
Do not allow me to take this unforgiveness, this hurt, and this bitterness into our next ministry assignment. Because those people have never done anything to us, and all they want to do is be led and love us. You know, sometimes you've got to go back. Sometimes you've got to really retrace your steps in order to understand. Our MMA, our mighty men here at Riverside, how many of you guys are in MMA? Stand up if you're in MMA, if you're in a group. Stand up. Come on, I want to see you again. Let's stand up. How many of you guys are in an MMA group? All right. All right, look at these guys. I'm proud of you. Amen. Hey, what these guys are doing is amazing. Well, number one, it's biblical, but it's just an amazing thing uh, of what they're involved in. I know several of you guys are not in that. Send me an email. We'll get you assigned to a, a, an MMA team. And uh, you, trust me, you need it. I believe biblically every man is supposed to be in some kind of relationship like that. This last month, April, our review has been sort of to look back in the past and, and see what it is that is keeping us from being really men of God. I mean, what is it in the past that has caused us to stumble to the point that where we are today is, is not what God's called men to be a part of and, and, and who God's called men to be? But there's got to be this willingness. There's got to be this understanding it's not weakness. Let me give you one more. I'm watching the clock here, and there's no way I'm going to get through probably even half of this. It's not dismissal of sin. Forgiveness is not dismissal of sin. Now, you need to know something. We as a church, we need to improve on this, but we as a church, we believe in what Matthew 18 says. In fact, you, you can turn to Matthew 18 for a moment. We're going to look at that in just a second. We're going to read through some verses here. No, the Bible is very, very clear that when someone sins and someone is habitually sinning, in other words, there's a practice of that sin, the Bible gives us a very clear process Number one, you're to go to them one-on-one and confront them about that sin. If they don't respond properly at that point, you're to take a brother or another person with you. If they don't respond then, they're to be taken to the church. Now, the way we do church today, I don't believe is exactly the way they did church in the New Testament. And I probably would never be a, an adherent of standing someone up in this gathering and, 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 and airing all the dirty laundry in front of all of you. First of all, I don't know that you have a personal relationship with Christ. So I don't know that all of you are part of the church. And frankly, nobody really knows if I am. I mean, I can give testimony of that, but nobody knows but God. And so we, we do that in, in a little bit tighter setting. We do that within our leadership, within the body of Christ that has been elected by our church to represent our church. And, and there are multiple people who are involved when it comes to that. And rarely, praise God, does it ever come to that. But forgiveness is not dismissal of sin. You need to understand that. But look at this. It's not giving in. It's not dismissal of sin. In the day that Christ was around, when Paul was writing these words, the rabbis, the Pharisees, the leaders, religious leaders, they were real big on the fact that you would forgive about three times. And so Peter gets in a discussion with Jesus. He's, he's pretty ticked off at some folks. And you can tell he's, ready to, he's, he's just ready to retaliate. And so Peter is trying to measure his words very carefully. And he begins this discourse with Jesus, beginning in verse 21 of Matthew 18. Are you there? Here we go. And then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And here's the question a lot of people ask today. Up to seven times? Now think how spiritual that sounded. I mean, the, <laughs> the standard, how many, how many times did the leader say? Three times. That was the common standard of the day. Three times. So here's what Peter does. Peter says, you know what? Watch this. I'm going to impress everybody. I mean, come on. He's not really wanting to forgive. That's really not his goal. And don't act like you can't believe Peter was doing this. So Peter's calculating in his mind. He said, okay, they say three. If I say three more, if I double it, that's six. And I tell you what I'm going to do, I'm going to slam one other one just on top of it. I'm going to sound like really spiritual. So Peter says to Jesus, hey, Jesus, how many times am I supposed to forgive? Seven times. And I almost see him kind of going. Impressive, right? I mean, in the culture of the day, seven, seven times. Look at this. 
Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. How many times is that? Wow. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. And this is the illustration he gives. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay his Lord, commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, and he seized him, began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe. And so his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him. Sound familiar? Right? Just like he did before. Saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. How dare we hold back forgiveness in light of what Christ has forgiven us? everything from everyone what do we win by holding on to the hurt the anger that accompany that accompany unforgiveness guys I'm going to jump all the way down to the bottom two things on the outline how do you deal with this practically and there's a few things that it's not but how do you deal with this practically You need to remember these two principles. Number one, Jesus forgives sin. Jesus forgives sin. Listen, that is absolutely amazing truth considering the nature of his holiness, his righteousness. He who knew no sin took on the sin of the world and paid for it. And then number two, if you're in Christ Jesus, Jesus calls you to forgive Jesus calls you to forgive how do I know when there's no longer any bitterness wrath anger clamoring go through the list when that's gone I have a pretty good indication that I'm free from any unforgiveness You ever wonder why people become so cranky and just hard to be around? Only time they have other friends or they find somebody that pretty much has the same disposition of them. I believe with all my soul that most of the time it's because of unforgiveness. I want you to stand with me just a moment. I want to do something this morning and we did it Wednesday night at the trailhead I I want you you guys and the musicians come on up while we get ready for this I want to ask you just an honest straight up question this morning is there anyone that you haven't forgiven of anything I'm not asking for testimonies. I'm not going to bring a mic around and let you go over it. Because I really believe that part of forgiveness is is deciding that I'm not going to bring it up. 
I, I'm not going to bring it up to them. I'm not going to bring it up to other people. And I'm, I'm not going to bring it up to myself. I'm going to let it go. I'm going to surrender. I'm, I'm going to let it go. Why? Because Christ has graciously forgiven me and, and I don't deserve it, nor do you. I, I know that it, it, it may be a horrible thing. It may be something that you're thinking in your mind, I, I cannot. Yes, you can. And I want to say it again, you're only hurting yourself by not letting it go. How many of you know what the universal sign of surrender is? If you know what it is, show me. Show me what the universal sign of surrender is. You know what it is? Yeah. All right, now come on. You can hold your arms up more than three seconds, okay? Universal sign of surrender. Okay, put your hands down. I'm going to ask our team here in just a moment. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to ask them just to lead us. But as I pray... I want you to think about that person or those persons that you have to this point been unwilling to forgive. And then when you're ready, as we're praying, when you're ready as we're praying, I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you to surrender universally. I'm going to ask you to surrender them to the Lord. Just like that, a physical act from you to say, Lord, I surrender And I forgive. So I'm going to close my eyes, and so is everybody else, because we're going to pray. But as we do that, if God puts one person on your heart, or maybe ten, would you be willing to lift your hands just like this as we pray and say, Lord, I forgive, I surrender. Father, I come to you right now, and I pray, Lord, that people would be delivered today in this room. God, I pray all across this room people will raise their hands and surrender. God, that they will extend the same kind of forgiveness that has been extended to them. God, I pray right now as you put people on their hearts and in their minds, God, Lord, that has kept them from maturing in Christ, that has hindered their prayer, their communication with family members and friends, and most importantly, communication with you, God, I pray right now that they'll surrender. Give them grace, God. Set them free, God. Extract that poison from their system, Jesus. Let them be free today, God. In Jesus' name.